Hello everyone, I am Miriam Bale. I'm the Artistic Director of the Indie Memphis Film Festival. And we are here today for an Indie Talk, um, which are sponsored by the Holmberg Foundation, uh, which we're very grateful for. And today the conversation is about labor issues in film production, something that is very re relevant today. Um, and uh, for those of you working in film production, but also for those of us who are film lovers and supporters, we really would like uh, everyone to have a clear idea of uh, issues that are currently going on with impending strikes and with changing labor production practices and also um, with profit since COVID. Um, it's a it's a deep issue, and I'm looking forward to learning more from our very esteemed guests, who I will introduce now. Um, uh, our first guest is um, Peter Curlin, and Peter is a motion picture production and sound mixer who also serves as the business agent of IATSE Local 492, representing many behind the camera employees in feature films television and commercials across all of Tennessee and Northern Mississippi. Thank you so much for being here, Peter. Certainly. And we, all, uh, we really appreciate uh, your knowledge. And um, we also have Chris Osborne. Chris is a director, editor, and film programmer based in New York. They were raised in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for being here, Chris. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, let's get into it. Um, this is something, um, so I, I'm going to ask you, so that, that we have been hearing for, for weeks, um, uh, I think in the news, at least for um, maybe for a couple of months about IATSE uh, impending strikes. Um, Peter, can you tell us a little bit more about what is I, what IATSE, um, sometimes known as IATSE, which I've learned today is frowned upon by those within the organization, but can you tell us a little bit more about what that organization is and how that's related to local unions? Uh, it's, it's, it's short for the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees and Motion Picture Machine Operators in the United States and Canada, which basically says we are um, the primary organization that represents um, behind the scenes workers in motion picture and television, uh, as well as stage. Um, in Memphis, for example, there's an additional local um, which covers uh, theatrical work um, and concerts and that sort of thing. And we cover uh, motion picture and television across the whole state of Tennessee and the northern half of Mississippi. Uh, and our members are grips and electrics and prop people and painters and construction people and sound people and special effects and wardrobe and uh, I'm leaving people out, but um, we basically represent everybody who works um, below the line, uh, except for camera, uh, hair and makeup and the people who work in the office. And um, you ha are a sound mixer, but recently you have been working less in the field and more, um, uh, more for the union, for the labor issues. I, I, you said, especially since COVID, can you talk about that a little bit, please? Well, I've, I've, I've continued my work as a sound mixer for, the, you know, for, for 40 years. And about 25 years ago, it became clear that there was a need for um, a labor organization like we have now um, for motion picture work in Tennessee. And um, Daryl Wilson, our, our current president, and I, uh, along with uh, a, a few others, petitioned the uh, IATSC to give us a chapter so, we, so that we could represent those people. Uh, and I've, I've held a, a role in that organization ever since, but I still work and most of my work is outside the state. Um, and so um, various people have done the business agent work, which is the day-to-day, -day, you know, keeping track of things and recruiting pictures and checking for, you know, problems on set. Um, 
but of late that's been me and uh, things have gotten complicated in the last couple of years, uh, as you point out, especially with the pandemic. And there was a, you know, we were considered um, essential workers and they wanted all the people in the film business to go back to work. Um, but, you know, most of our work is inside in large groups and it was, you know, dangerous, particularly early in the pandemic when really nobody knew how to uh, properly protect people. Um, they didn't even know how the disease spread. Um, and so uh, I ended up spending a huge amount of time educating our members, uh, helping to set up rules. You know, there was a, a, a huge multi-union committee that was formed with the Producers Association, the AMPTP, to come up with protocols and guidelines for how to keep people safe on set. Uh, and those protocols were established and they've been continually revised uh, but they're still in effect, and they're what requires um, regular testing and wearing of masks on interiors, and uh, there was a certain amount of sanitation required, and there was a staffing requirement to have somebody on set who was responsible for uh, COVID safety. All those things came out of those meetings, which I participated in, and now we have to enforce them because uh, depending on the production and their funding, some of those things are harder to implement than others. But uh, at this point, um, money is less of an issue than actual crew safety. So that means a lot of um, uh, supervision of these or productions to make sure things are being done properly. And that's mostly what I've been doing for the last couple of years. And then a few months ago, um, as I'm sure we'll discuss, um, the, con both the contracts that covered our employees on the West Coast, uh, as well as across the rest of the United States, both of those contracts expired. And so now there's been this ongoing um, negotiation to uh, revise and renew those agreements. Um, what are some of the new issues, Peter, that have come up, like the new, um, what are some of the, the new demands that have been especially um, prickly in these negotiations or, um, or not, well, or hard won? Well, the, the, the biggest thing is uh, what we call the quality of life issues. The, uh, in the, recently, the, the days on set have become very, very long. The time that people are able to spend at home has become very, very short. Um, there's a thing that's developed, which we call fratter days, where um, because the, the start times of the day, the call times seem to get later and later during the course of the week, by the time you go to work on Friday afternoon, um, you end up working halfway into Saturday, and then you have to go back to work early Monday morning, so people don't get a full weekend. Um, and it's exhausting and uh, causes fatigue, which is dangerous. Um, so that's that's been a big issue. The other issue, which is uh, was always an issue but became much worse during the pandemic is uh, meal breaks because nobody could ever sit down during the pandemic and have a big group lunch like we used to do. It became hard to have meal breaks. Um, it was hard to bring food to the set because people can't take their masks off on set. Uh, and ultimately there got to be a pattern where a lot of productions just weren't ever breaking for lunch. And we had to find a way to stop that from getting worse, actually to improve it. So those were, those were the big driving issues. And there's, of course, there's always economic issues, um, but the big ones were these quality of life issues. And then there were like little minor issues that became major, like in our agreement, the, the rate that people are used to use their personal car uh, in the course of the day uh, has been very, very low for for decades, and it was always a little bit of a problem, but it became much more of a problem during the pandemic where transporting the crew in vans in, in groups stopped happening. People were required to use their car more and more. And if you're actually losing money on paying for gas and maintenance on your car because the rate was so low, that was a, that was a big problem. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. And Chris, you've worked in production for years, and we've noticed um, 
in industry, it, it, throughout many industries, throughout the, the world, especially, um, uh, especially I think among younger workers, a real change in attitude about work generally in the pandemic. Um, the things that people used to be willing to put up with as normal stopped feeling, stopped seeming acceptable. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, about this change in attitude towards work and how that's affecting um, some of these negotiations and demands? And does that feel, have you noticed that? Does that seem new to you in some ways? Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm I'm fairly young. I'm 32. I have been working in the industry like straight out of college in a number of different capacities. And I think at least, you know, for me personally and my friends, there's been sort of this backlash against the idea of um, sort of like paying dues within the industry. And that's not a matter of not um, working up the ranks or taking on difficult work, but more of a challenge of the expectation to put yourself into very dangerous or abusive situations um, for the benefit of your career overall. And I think that that sort of crystallized recently um, with the, the uh, release of the anonymous uh, Instagram account, IA Stories, which was a really interesting compilation of workers, largely younger workers in film crews experiences dealing with all of the, like the abuses that Peter was speaking about. Um, there's kind of this expectation that, uh, you know, we're supposed to grin and bear it, especially if we're young and green on set. Um, and sometimes that can be enforced even by uh, well, by people in posi positions of power above us, like producers, but even some of the department heads who we work under, that because we took those lumps, you have to as well. And generally speaking, given that for millennials and Gen Z and pretty much all young workers across the board, our quality of life has gone down just like, you know, generally speaking. Um, we don't have the benefit of a lot of the same comforts that perhaps other generations did. Um, and as a result of that, like, we just don't have the patience for it. <laughs> I mean, I would just basically say that. <laughs> no, that's good. And it's about time for people to recognize that. You know, I, uh, my friend Kay, uh, who I worked with for years, calls us the new old guys, because some of us who have been around for 40 years remember when conditions were much better. And when there wasn't this thing that's very close to hazing, where you end up, you know, expected to work 20 hours a day, and that's just what you put up with, we didn't have to live that. And then it got, it's just gotten worse and worse. And so people who are, are new to the industry now are experiencing an industry that's not what I started in. And I, I can't imagine coming into this business the way it's been the last few years and saying, hey, this is something I really want to do. You know, I've always liked making films. I know, I assume, Chris, you love the making films we all seem to, but it's what you have to put up with to do it is, has just gotten to be extreme. And that's, that's what we went into the negotiating rooms to try to change, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's going to be a long process. Yeah. And I think that another element to that um, is just sort of the demand for content is just at an all-time high. There's just more stuff getting made constantly um, and in a lot of different ways. There's films, there's TV shows that are more traditional. There's also streaming shows. There's commercials, there's social media content that I, I do a lot of editing work. So I, uh, most of the stuff I cut is just social media content, you know, and all of that just means that there's more work being produced and more work and more labor that is involved in producing it, that it's hard to keep up with that demand and still uh, have really good working conditions. Yeah, uh, and there's, you know, there's obviously, there's a big labor shortage in general in the United States now. Um, and uh, employment is, it's, it's a little swinging back towards the worker side now because the employers have to pay better in order to get employees at all, much less, you know, competent employees. And so that's why you're seeing um, 
you know, this minimum wage fight, which was very slow to get started, but now suddenly so many states have, uh, have doubled the minimum wage within their state uh, and it continues to go up. Um, because people have options for employ employment now and they can get jobs that pay better and have better conditions and they don't wanna put up with something less, uh, particularly when you know, we're still in an era where you're risking your life to go to work, uh, particularly in the movie business. Uh, I'll just say that the, um, the protocols that I mentioned with testing, uh, we've screened out literally thousands of people who came to work thinking they were fine. And before they were able to get into the set, they were tested and they were shown to, um, to test positive. And those are situations that without taking a lot of care, those could have been, you know, huge life-threatening incidents. And, you know, that's a lot to, uh, that's a lot to do for, you know, for a low wage and, uh, and, a, and a difficult working environment. I think, yeah, that's all really interesting. Um, uh, you'd mentioned the hazing and Chris mentioned, you know, paying dues um, was the idea in the past um, before uh, it was life-threatening and deemed essential work, uh, was it the idea that working in film was this glamorous, lucky opportunity that you just had to go through, you know, that you were lucky to do it, and that's why, uh, you know, it's better than a desk job or something? Is that is that the attitude you were seeing, Chris? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that there is sort of this um, subliminal sense that you should be grateful to be here. Um, and because so many other people either want to be in these positions and didn't get hired or just the nature of making films or making art generally uh, is better than, you know, the flipping burgers idea. And uh, it's extremely condescending. Um, it, it completely neglects the idea of, of how much like real labor is involved in creating a film, how collaborative things are, um, and all of the kind of like demands of the environment. Um, even before there was a life-threatening uh, pandemic that is just, you know, permeating over everything. And the skill level involved to work in this industry now is very, very high. And so people spend either a lot of time in school or they spend a lot of time working in, um, in the less well-paying branches of the industry in order to learn their crafts. And they, you know, and I think it's, it's often not respected that, that all of these people are, um, they have skills and experience that, are, that should be rewarded properly and, and those people should be treated with respect. Because there is always somebody, there's always somebody who's less skilled and less experienced who's willing to take the job and producers just have to understand, well, that just slows things down and makes things more dangerous. Um, now it's getting a little bit better now. In one way it's worse because there's such a demand for people that new people are coming in the industry with less experience. Uh, but in some ways um, it's, it's, it's better because the the employers have to work harder to get good people and now they want to help train and they want to do all of these things to bring new people into the industry and and they they have to treat those people respect respectfully or they'll find some other industry to get into yeah um uh chris you had mentioned the increase in demand for content uh social media and obviously um other online sources um, but especially streaming, of course, we've seen the need, the, the shift towards that since the pandemic. And um, something that um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of is that it is a collaborative process, but the, the profits are not being shared um, fairly, that especially for streaming, there are a few tech companies that are seeing, seeing the profits for things that um, that, uh, that, that the actual people making the work, um, even people like Scarlett Johansson, but especially people below the line are not seeing fair compensation uh, compared to the profit. Can, can either of you or both of you talk about that issue? 
Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the uh, Peter, you probably have more to say on the IA's perspective on how streaming residuals can feed into pensions. I, I can't speak to that because um, most of my experience is more on the indie side, um, non-union shoots. And a lot of those films are created by, you know, hired hands, like people who are just contracted for the job. They put in their time and then have nothing to really show for it at the end of it. You know, their their wage is all that they get from it. Whether the film blows up to be something like The Witch or Hereditary or something, or it's uh, you know a smaller film that that plays a few like regional festivals, the result is ultimately the same. And something that I have been a huge proponent of in in my own work and trying to push for is a more cooperative way to run a film production where every single person who works on it gets back end points, um, which is a share of ownership uh, on the project so that as it becomes, if it becomes profitable, they get a share of that. Just to add some sense of continuity to these roles, especially for below the line crew, um, who don't often have much like job security or something to really like hang their hat on as um, beyond just a, a good experience. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, I'll, I'll add that one of the reasons that work has pro proliferated so much is that all these individual streaming services, um, they all want their own content now. And it used to be that Netflix would buy content from all the different production entities and now everybody wants to have their own. And so if, if NBC makes some product that they really like, they're not likely to send it to Netflix when they can run it on you know, Peacock. Uh, so that, that's one aspect. You know, the thing, Chris, that you talk about in terms of sharing residual, I mean, sharing residuals or royalties is a great idea, but most of these companies are very, very um, tight-lipped about how many viewers there are for individual programs, how much money they are making out of, out of each project, and so unlike in the days where, you know, you could you could open up Hollywood Reporter and see what the box office was for a film and you could say, oh, well, I, my, my deal is I get, you know, 1% of gross box office. Uh, now you can't tell that anymore. I think that's what happened to Scarlett Johansson. Um, and so th that means that a lot of this money has to be resolved up front. It's very hard to get anything out of the back end without, um, uh, without you know some sort of special deal with the with the streamers, and they really don't want to share that information. And it's yeah, because they're they're not just so in, they don't care as much if one particular show is incredibly successful as if that show will help them to gain subscribers to see other shows because their money comes entirely from subscriptions. Yeah, well, and it also comes from debt. I think the one thing about streamers that to me is maddening and crazy is that it's VC money, it's funding through like credit lines and debt. Um, so there just is not, they're not, um, they're not entertainment companies, I'll say. Exactly. They're, tech, they're, they're tech companies. The product is not the content. The content is, um, is, a, is a way to get the product, which is us, which is our data, you know? And I think that as a result of that, that devalues what they produce. Um, it devalues the data around it, the analytics that they use to kind of decide what the value of their company is when you can kind of, you know, but I, I think at least before with studios, it's a very clear idea that you pay, a customer buys a ticket at a movie theater, they go and they sit and experience the movie and that is shared with theaters and whatever they get is their profit. Now there's all these other kinds of ways of determining success where 90 million people watch Squid Game. Uh, that's what they tout. And it, the metric is they watched two minutes of the thing. Right. That's what they determine. And other things like impact value in terms of, you know, how many subscribers do they think that Tiger King got them? So that makes the numbers so much more opaque and harder for, um, uh, or I guess easier for them to kind of pocket it 
uh, and make the numbers mean whatever they want it to mean so that they don't necessarily have to share it with the laborers that they contract to, to create that value for them. Yeah, there's, there's another thing which I find very disturbing and there's not much to be done about it, but there's been a, a huge consolidation of media companies um, so that you know one one parent company might own 10 or 15 or 20 different kinds of distribution um, but even more to the more to the fact that with the exception i would say uh, of netflix which is in the business of making and exhibiting movies you know most of the movies now are being made by companies that you know their big business is you know selling toilet paper through the mail or uh, you know, selling people phones, and or you know, they're part of some multinational conglomerate that um, that has that where actual motion picture production and the profits from it are a very very tiny part of their portfolio. And so, from a, a negotiating end, when you're trying to say to somebody, you know, if you don't, you know, improve our working conditions we're going to withhold our labor well they say well i you know that's not so bad i mean we'll that's not going to cut into the, the the phones we sell so that that's that's a challenge and it also means from a creative and i think it's much harder for the creative people uh to you know find deals with these companies because they're they're run by people who are looking at the at the overall bottom line and the stock value as much as they are you know what's good product uh the, the exception might be that if 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 uh, if you're a Netflix or an Amazon or an Apple, you you want cachet in the industry, and that helps you get subscribers. And so you want to make some product that you can point to and say, look, this is a thing that we did that's really high quality and successful. And that's why a lot of these streaming services are releasing their films first in the theaters, even if it's only for a day, so that they can you know they can call them theatrical releases for you know awards purposes. Wow, that's a whole other topic of conversation of how these these big conglomerates are and the relationship to awards and so many aspects of awards. But um, we'll save that for another day. But it's really fascinating. But Peter, I would love to know more about you mentioned earlier the quality of life things that you've been fighting for. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the compensation issues related to what we just talked about, like um, what what are some of the issues you've been able to fight for, and um, and I don't know how much you can reveal about, you know, you've been in negotiations basically up until this conversation. So I don't yeah, know. Until late late last night is when we finally settled here. I mean, the order of things was that the the the, the two major contracts that that cover uh, filmmaking at a certain level and all these streaming services. One is called the Basic Agreement, which is on the West Coast covers the 13 Hollywood locals. Um, and then there's the area standards agreement, which is an agreement that's been around for uh, coincidentally about the same amount of time as, as my local, because uh, that was a time of expansion of the, of the film industry into the Southeast. Um, and both of, those, both of them expired at the same time, but the West Coast basic agreement was negotiated first. Um, and they came to the table with, I think, modest demands, which were, you know, um, 10 hour rest period at the end of the day, you know, more of a, of a requirement to break for meals, um, things of that nature. And they made no headway whatsoever. And weeks went by and the producers were not making a, uh, a realistic offer to solve the issues. Uh, and I think that is primarily what led to the strike threat. Um, in, in our organization, our constitution basically says that the members all have to essentially agree to, to hold a strike. And so we have a thing called strike authorization. A lot of unions have this where they took a ballot and if, uh, it's a little complicated, but if, if 75% of the membership says that they are willing to strike for these things. Then the international president at the bargaining table has the authority to say to um, the employers, you know, if you don't come back to the table, we will strike. 
Um, and we took that vote. And the results were in the, I mean, in Tennessee, the, we had 99% of the membership voted and uh, almost 100% voted for the strike authorization. Across the country, it was more than 90% um, of people voted, which is very rare. Usually our, you know, our like officer elections are like 30% turnout. Um, but this was over 90% and virtually all people said they wanted to give the strike authorization. Um, but that did not mean we were intending to strike. That just mean, meant we need the authorization. And when we got that, the employers came back to the table on the West Coast. They resolved some of the issues, but they still didn't go very far and they were dragging their feet. And people were very frustrated because what the employers were doing simultaneously is having people work you know, seven days a week to finish projects, which, which can allow them, if we struck, to go for a longer period of time without having to make anything because they're putting stuff into the pipeline. Um, so ultimately, you know, our international president said, if you don't come back to the table and resolve these issues, um, and he gave them a deadline, and I can no longer remember what the deadline was, but it was like, you know, 12.01 a.m. on a Monday, then we will strike and you won't be able to go back into production, you know, Monday morning. Uh, and that did cause them to come back to the table and make significant improvements. And they were able to conclude their agreement. But once they were done, we had to go in with the same group. Uh, but frankly, I think they were more motivated at that point. And the strike authorization was still there. There wasn't a strike deadline, but as it turns out, we didn't need it. Um, I think there was a lot of, this 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 national strike thing has never happened before in the history of the IATSC. Uh, we have little strikes all over the country all the time for you know trying to get non-union productions to sign contracts, um, things things of that nature. But it's never been national before, and there was a lot of education of the members as to what we were trying to achieve, and there was a lot of hope that came up because people were risking their livelihoods to. Um, to get improvements in, in the quality of life. Um, and uh, so it was, it's a mixed bag. What we ended up with was what we always end up with, which is a compromise with the employers. It's a good compromise, but you know, those people who really um, were upset and saying things have to change completely and we wanna have 12 hours off every night, uh, I think that's reasonable, but the employers didn't. Um, but those people are, you know, will be somewhat disappointed and other people will realize that you know, we addressed issues uh, in a way that has never, that have never been accomplished before. There's never been weekend turnaround in this agreement before. There's never been uh, uh, 10 hour uh, daily rest periods before. And there's never been this, this thing called prevailing rate meal penalties before, which essentially say that if, if, you, if you go late for lunch, a certain amount at that point, you have to pay people basically triple their current rate to keep working. And that's not designed to make more money for the crew. That's designed to force the um, productions to find a cheaper way to solve their problem than solving it by not feeding the crew. And that's always been the issue with these agreements. All these things over time and meal penalties and everything are all there to allow the production flexibility when there's an issue, but to not make abusing the crew the cheapest way out of a problem. Uh, and, and we have, you know, so if it turns out that for some reason um, there is no other way to solve the problem, they can, they can pay to have that happen, but it's enough money they'll have to pay that maybe they realize, oh, well, maybe we should rent that crane for an extra day, or maybe we should pick another location that we can shoot in for more than six hours. And that's never been the calculus before. Uh, what would a national strike like that look like? I know that um, when the Writers Guild uh, uh, had a strike uh, decades ago, um, it brought it it um, it was successful in some ways, and then it brought in a lot of reality television and changed kind of the industry. I know this is completely speculative. But what what like um, would we what would that what would that strike look like? Would it just be unprecedented uh, to even know what it is like to would it? Uh, Chris, do you think it would mean indie productions would change? Would be more 
would there be um, more abuses within the indie field if that happened? How what what would that have, that have looked like? Um, I personally, again, it's totally speculative. Um, I, I I personally think that it would be for uh, the good of the film industry overall. Um, I think that a strike would allow some of these compromises um, to turn into, um, you know, like all of the demands being met by workers. Uh, I think that it, it would make a 12 hour turnaround time, for instance, which is not out of the question, I agree, like Peter, um, not just be sort of a dream, but like a, an inevitability. Uh, I, th I see in terms of the like indie side of things, it's hard to say. I think there will be there would be growing pains. Obviously, there would be you know corners cut even further. I think that uh, you know that these big companies aren't going to you know cave to demands like so quickly. But I do think that what happens in these big sets um, it does trickle down to indie. And I think if the tone is set on union sets and union shoots, union productions, um, to meet quite frankly, like the barest level of security and safety for all laborers, um, it wouldn't then become normalized on indie sets. I think the thing that, you know, again, this may be going a little bit off topic, but at least for me, I, I feel like the strike, uh, the threat of the strike really has major consequences for indie productions. For all of us who do work on non-union shoots, many of the films at Indie Memphis are non-union shoots, it forces us to really question how we run our sets, um, even without the pressure of a union. Uh, what kind of environment do we wanna foster in our smaller projects? Um, and what sort of behaviors are no longer normalized. Even if we can't pay the same rates as um, bigger shoots, that shouldn't then also mean the trade-off for these quality of life issues that have raised their heads on bigger productions. And so personally speaking, from my perspective, I think that a strike and all of these conversations, even just the threat of the strike, um, have significantly positive benefits for indie and non-union shoots. I, I am so happy to hear that because even in our our caucus room, when we're discussing what these issues are, we're we were not unaware of the fact that this that the decisions we make have repercussions beyond our own sets. That they do extend to non-union production uh, and throughout the world because we're essentially setting a standard. And you know, if if the at a, at a very, very basic level, if the terms and conditions on non-union work are dramatically worse than they are on union work, then it's very hard to get crews for it. It's gonna be hard enough now with the demand for labor because lower budget shows are gonna really have a, a, a difficult time competing with the bigger budget shows. But if you have a low budget show and you don't feed people regularly and you don't let people sleep and you do things like they've been done the last few years, um, and you have at the same time uh, a huge expansion of union work, people are all going to do that instead. And so if you want to continue to be able to make your product, and maybe you can't afford a union contract, but what you can or you're going to be forced to do is provide you know, the best possible working conditions. And, and as I said frequently during, uh, you know, during these negotiations, most of the things that we demanded from the, from the production companies didn't have a price tag on them because sure it's triple time if you don't feed people and it's double time if you make people work past 12 hours but if you don't make people work 12 past 12 hours and if you feed them regularly it doesn't cost a penny so um if you're on if you have a very low budget and you want to save money and you want the crew to be happy you just have to keep your your shoot days reasonable you have to you know break when possible and uh, hopefully, a lot of the safety things that we're implementing uh, that will also more than trickle down. I'm hoping that will, you know, come down hard on uh, independent film production to make sure that people are doing things safely. And also, I'll just add: I think that in 
indie, you know, it is a testing ground for bigger projects and bigger productions. It's where a lot of producers and a lot of just crew people generally, uh, you know, start to level up in their careers. And I think that a lot of bad habits do start on those shoots. Um, the problem is, is that it continues on as the scale grows. Uh, and I think that if that was, I think that in indie, there's just a generally like a fetish, they fetishize like scrappiness, like, you know, how low is the budget? How many, how few shoot days did you get this like great movie made? Did you shoot on an iPhone, you know? And I think that all of that just sort of like regiments this mentality of that the base level of security and the core safety of the laborers is secondary to the art. Um, and it's it's untenable, it's, it's unsustainable, um, but it would be a lot harder for that to kind of foment uh, if it were impossible on big budget union productions and unfortunately i notice just hearing from my friends and what i've seen like the worst abuses that you that you hear about on indie sets also occur on bigger shoots it doesn't totally matter the scale of the project in terms of the competence of producers and the safety violations oftentimes these these same problems still arise and so that says to me that this is systemic of how production is run um, and there needs to be somebody to answer for it. And so I'm personally, I'm so happy that this threat of a strike has raised these issues to the consciousness of most people who don't know what a film set is like and don't know what it takes to make the things that we all love and enjoy. And, and some, of, uh, some of these issues, and you know, I'll harp a little bit on safety issues because that is you know, near and dear to my heart and it's very timely this week. Um, but um, one of the things that we do is we have mandatory safety training that specifically teaches people you know, the, the very specific dangers on a motion picture set. Um, we, we have mandatory uh, harassment prevention training, uh, which, is in, which is crucial right now. Um, and we have uh, mandatory COVID safety classes. So even if there's not somebody standing over your shoulder saying, you know, you must put your mask on, uh, you know what you can do to be safe and to keep others safe. And some of those things are expensive to implement and some of them are not expensive. And I'm hoping that um, that, that culture of safety uh, expands and that it greatly trickles down into uh, independent, low budget filmmaking, even student films, because, you know, we're all human beings, we're all fragile. And it doesn't matter, you know, if you're on a, to your point, Chris, if you're on a, an independent film with a budget of $100,000, and you are desperately trying to scrape everything together to get through the days, and to finish your film before you run out of money, that's a lot of pressure. But it's, it's almost identical kinds of pressure to somebody who's got $30 million, and they've got 30 days to shoot or 40 days to shoot their film. But there's a studio executive saying, you have to stay under budget. You have to stay under schedule. You're going to lose your actor you know, on November 15th. You're going to lose your locations. I mean, it's the same pressure all the way down. And all of us have to prevent that pressure from, um, from making uh, safety and, and, and crew quality of life you know, go out the window. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I, I just got to jump in on that front. Like, I couldn't agree more because I also think like if you overextend and overwork, underfeed, underrest your workers, you know, even for the people who want to be there, like for small indie films who are comprised of people who genuinely do care about the art form and are just there because it's a great project and stuff. Even if you do that there, they can't do their best work under the circumstances. So even from a purely like artistic, critical kind of standpoint, like you'll always have a compromised film if you work under those conditions. It will never be what it could be. Um, and so I, I personally reject that sort of like mentality again, that is I think fomented in indie that you gotta be scrappy or you gotta be a tyrant or you, you gotta like be uncompromising um, that is not true. 
that is not true at all. I don't think that good work comes from those situations. Um, and if it does, uh, it's not worth it. I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, from a pure production efficiency standpoint, if you're trying to get your work done in a certain amount of time, but all that time is after people have worked for 16 hours and they're exhausted and it's nighttime or whatever it turned out to be, the 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 productivity drops in, you know, by more than half at that point. And so you'd be so much better coming in the next day with a rested fed crew and continue to work. You get not just more work done, but higher quality work. Um, and, I, and I have another pet peeve. I, I you know, I, I started off in the independent film world and worked there for a long time. I produced an independent film. Um, and, and I, it's, it's critical that when you start the project that you spend enough time to get the resources you need to do the project. It's, it's crazy to enter into, you know, into some endeavor when you're not prepared to do it. And if, if I were an independent producer, again, what I would do is one, make sure I had all the money and the people that I needed to make that project before I started um, and not try to make up for it by, you know, overworking the crew or cutting corners. Um, I would make sure everybody was treated well. Uh, I, those, and of course, the cheapest, you know, the cheapest approach in both low, low budget and large budget filmmaking is preparation. The more preparation you do, the faster everything goes and the safer it is. And, and that's a stylistic thing. And I, that's a, that, this is a topic for another conversation, but um, people who like to figure it out as they go and they feel that that gives them a, you know, a more uh, lively project or something, they're really um, binding themselves up in a way where they will never get the most and the best work done on their projects, in my opinion. You both just talked, you both talked, touched on something that brings up issues of equity as well. Like, uh, Chris, you mentioned this idea of the tyrant that has led to some abuses um, uh, of, you know, the director as, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, a, a brat, uh, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, bad behavior being rewarded. And um, Peter, you mentioned about anti-harassment training and something that I imagine has come up in negotiations in quality of life also has to do with probably people with families and how to balance having families and um, which unfortunately childcare often uh, falls to women in our, in our culture, which is unfortunate. I have definitely seen uh, director couples get to a point where the woman in the couple becomes the stay-at-home mom because it's not tenable for her while the, her, her partner is making more and ends up becoming the breadwinner, and it it you know perpetuates these inequities. Um, so I, I'd love to hear both of you talk about how these labor issues and labor demands can help equity in film as well. Well, specifically as to the issue with with uh, maternity leave and that sort of thing, we went to the table um, proposing. Um, family leave, bereavement leave, um, sick leave, uh, and there was one other one which I'm forgetting at the moment, but, um, and we, those were in our package up until the very end and ultimately we were only able to achieve paid sick leave, but that's a, that's a first ever, um, and that's a huge step forward, but there's, there's, there's still an issue with people who have, you know, who have family lives and family issues and how they can address those while they're working. Um, and that's, that's got to be, ultimately, that has to be resolved. And that's, that's a problem nationally in every industry. Yeah, wow. and I, I would say that, like, the th one of the things that really stuck with me as I was, you know, after I followed the anonymous Instagram account, the IA Stories account that compiles stories from film workers, is how often that became a theme throughout of, I don't see my family anymore, or I don't see my kids anymore, or I'm too exhausted when I do get to see my family, 
all the way up to issues around, you know, women and other other people who are pregnant on set. Um, you know, there's just it's not uh, it's not feasible. It's not it's not um, it's not sustainable uh, to be so married to a job that you have no life outside of it. And I think that the nature of film a lot of the time is that because it's an art form is it demands your full commitment and it's just not true that you have to you know dedicate everything to it um it is an art form it's not like other jobs but you are still working it is still your labor um and i think that any sort of job that paints itself as your everything that has to fulfill you spiritually, familial, familially, like everything uh, is just, it's the perfect environment for abuse to fester. Yeah. And I, you'd have to interview my children to, to get a, a, a real perspective on this. Uh, and I don't know what, what kind of answer you get out of them because they're, in, you know, they're, they're approaching middle age now, but um, the trade-off I decided early in my career was um, I'm going to be working, you know, very, very hard, relatively long hours. But for me, it was a bigger issue because all my work was out of town. So they could have been giving me 14 hours off every night. It wouldn't have mattered because I would be staying in a hotel in some other city. Um, in return for which I could do, you know, two, two movies, even four movies a year. And I could end up working half the year instead of all around. And so the time that I had off was you know quality time and I had all the time in the world to do things and I you know looking back I'm not sure that that was um, that was a, a, a reasonable trade I, I, I understand my, you know I, I can think back on my motivations for that but there's something about going home every day and seeing your family resolving issues when they come up having to um, take care of somebody when they're ill you know helping with you know, all the various household demands um, that it doesn't work to try to compress all of that into one, you know, two month period where you're not working and then expect your, your partner to deal with everything else the rest of the time. And if, if you're, a, if you're a single person and you have a house or an apartment and there's just nobody there to take care of any of that stuff and you don't have time, you know, you don't have time to pay your bills. You don't have time to do whatever. I don't know how that's sustainable. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult trade-off and there's a lot of stuff that people are willing to sacrifice to, to feed their creative spirit. And I think that that's a valuable, um, way to look at it, except that it feels different when your job in, is more involved with, you know, moving sandbags or setting up lights or even recording sound and you're not going to, you know, be able to point to this and say, well, this is a movie with my name over the title, or this is, you know, I'm now going to get, you know, X number of percentage of all the profits that this film ever makes. None of those people, this has to do that, that equity thing. None of the blow the line people are going to have that experience. And so they have to get their reward from the work. And that means they've got to be well compensated and they have to be well treated. So we, we're talking about equity, um, which obviously can have multiple 
meetings and um, in negotiations. Uh, we're also talking about family, work-life balance, um, uh, and harassment training. Um, and then there's also, I believe, Peter, some, um, I believe there's also been some issues about DEI and diversity and inclusion, something that's very important in Memphis and in Indy Memphis. Um, is that something you could speak to? Yes, so as part of um, these negotiations, one issue of mutual concern, which we both ended up with gains at the table, was in implementing uh, a, a DEI uh, initiative that is going to allow us to bring new people, people from underserved communities, people of color, um, to, to try to make the movie sets more representative of the community where the movies are being shot. Um, and one of the initiatives is that the, the, the production companies are now going to try to identify help us identify uh, new people to come into the business, train them, give them an opportunity to learn a craft on the set um, while subsidizing them to do that. So that, and then we will take them into membership um, so that we can we can diversify further our membership. We've never, you know, speaking from Ireland local, we've never had any barriers to joining. Anybody can come in anytime and just join. Uh, nothing stops that from happening. But we have to reach the communities of people and give them an opportunity to get in. And we have to give them um, uh, better examples of people from their community that are, are working in the business successfully. And so this gives us an opportunity to do that. Dr. I'm I'm in the, I'm in the back. Um, Chris, I, I was, do you have anything to comment on that within the indie world and on how these labor issues are related to ideas of, of racial and gender um, um, equity and inclusion? Yeah, I mean, I think that obviously it's, I mean, I'm non-binary. It's a very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky sort of thing in terms of, um, you know, at least from my perspective of, gender parity and inclusion of all kinds of genders in independent film, um, I think that that often falls upon, I think, like uh, programming and like festivals and stuff. I think that that work is being made. Getting it seen um, is, is sort of more on the like, you know, distribution and uh, festival side. Um, in terms of labor and how that manifests itself on set, I feel a lot of like technical roles are still dominated by, you know, white guys. And um, part of that is like the funnel that comes from academia, of just the, the training that many people receive at prestigious universities, um, as well as sort of the absence of training programs like uh, what Peter was talking about. And I think as, as many perspectives and people that can be brought into the fold, um, it just, it's the right thing to do. It's also going to make better films. I mean, I just think that ultimately, like at, at, the, at the most like craven core level, like the, having diversity both above and below the line, it's just gonna, it's going to lead to better movies. More interesting movies Way more, interesting. Sure. more yeah absolutely from a programming perspective um the, the industry I, I have felt um largely is very um very friendly and open to people of you know different genders different backgrounds uh and you know certainly amongst the community in which i work there's already a fair amount of inclusion um but when you're trying to bring in um new people, um, it's hard to get those people to, you know, department head positions and, and, and above when they don't get the opportunity to get to get into even the entry level positions. So it's going to take a lot of years before we see the efforts that are being made now um, end up making, the, you know, the whole crew across not having that issue that Chris identified where a lot of the department heads tend to be white male. Uh, there was also an issue in our industry, which is that there's there's been very specific job positions that tend to be in certain, uh, occupied by people in certain genders. And it isn't that the rates are different for, for example, men and women, 
um, but that if if the for example if if makeup artists have traditionally been men and hairstylists have been traditionally women and you make the rate for a hairstylist less then you're going to end up with a, a gender disparity even though the, the actual pay rate is not you know set for um to, to discriminate um but there's other positions production office staff uh, and and whatnot those people those roles which have traditionally been occupied by women had have paid very poorly and it has it has caused this real disparity and that was one of the things that we also did at the bargaining tables we set new minimum rates for those positions that tend to be uh, low paying entry level positions and have traditionally had women in those positions that we're trying to make those positions pay as well as anything else um, and that's 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 going to be rapid change um, some of these other things will be will be a little slow. Wow, um, that uh, th it's really fascinating. And again, a topic for another conversation. I think there's so much to discuss about this. Um, but as this has been a fascinating conversation, I really wanna thank you both. I've learned so much and I'm sure our viewers have. One thing, um, uh, Peter, you had mentioned that it was uh, the idea of safety. Um, uh, it was unfortunately very timely this week. Um, and I was wondering if either of you or both of you could comment on how the tragedy on the set of Rust, how that has to do with some of these, um, these labor issues that, that we've been speaking of. Well, there was a direct connection between the, the, the Rust incident and some of the, the discussions we've had because a lot of the experienced crew had uh, done the thing that, that, that crew tend to do, which is if you're in a situation where you're feeling, you know, abused, you leave. And it's always everybody's right to leave. And they didn't feel like they were getting enough rest. They felt like they were, you know, not being paid on time. There were a lot of issues that led them to leave. And when then you lose a lot of the experienced people on the crew, then, you know, mistakes get made. And, um, I can't speak to the particular circumstances there because I think we're still waiting for all the facts to come out. Um, but some things seem, seem very clear. They had, um, they already had issues having to do with, um, with exhaustion. That always is a factor. Um, they had other production related issues. They didn't have enough money. All these things tend to have safety become uh, harder to enforce. Uh, but ultimately, um, we've had uh, we've had weapon safety classes in our local to teach people the difference between live rounds and dummy rounds, and to know how to check a weapon to make sure you know it's not loaded. Um, those kind of safety classes are going to be imperative, um, and it doesn't hurt to have that, even if you've got an experienced armor, even if you've got you know, a safety-minded AD, you know, even if you've got a safety-minded performer, um, if, if they don't all know exactly what a protocol needs to be to keep people safe, you will have an incident. And I think in this particular case, um, again, not knowing all the facts, but usually it takes more than one error for something like this to happen. There were several places along the line for, um, for this to have been prevented and none of them happened. And so any, any individual crew member on any set has the ability to flag a dangerous situation, call it to people's attention, and make an issue out of it. And unfortunately, um, when they, you know, they knew these kind of issues were developing, and uh, they weren't able to resolve it fast enough. That I guess they couldn't get the the they couldn't get the right people to listen in time. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that, um, you know, I, I also can't speak to the exact circumstances of what occurred. I think we're all still sussing out um, the facts of the situation, but like the, the main takeaway is that these are all avoidable. Every last thing that happened on that set was avoidable. It appears to have been called out by workers multiple times across the entire shoot. 
Um, if what's being reported is true, there was a walkout from camera crew. Uh, they were replaced by production. Um, so it's not a matter of just a, a single um, incident where someone's eye was off the ball. These are very systemic issues. Um, they plague a bunch of different kinds of sets uh, and uh, they're all avoidable. And they're, they are, in my opinion, the result of an industry that prioritizes um, profit over safety and security. Uh, I think that there was a lot of things that happened on that set that happened on a lot of sets where, um, you know, like we were talking about earlier, these, there are a lot of producers who, you know, don't properly budget or schedule their shoots uh, appropriate to the scale of the work being done. And that puts pressure on everyone around them um, to make the impossible happen. Uh, and unfortunately, when you do put people in those kinds of situations, um, really horrible, horrible things can happen. And I don't view them as mistakes. Uh, th this is very much designed uh, and, it, and it's avoidable. And I hope that what comes of this really, really tragic situation um, is that we view this not as an isolated moment of negligence, um, not just you know, banning certain weaponry on film sets or, you know, which I think I'm in favor of personally, but that to really get at the core of why this happens and so many other things that have been reported throughout the, the previous months, it's a top-down failure. And, uh, you know, like <laughs> we, need, we need to like, to preserve the safety of our workers and the health of this industry uh, fix something very fast. Wow. Well, um, I want to, I want to thank you, uh, both so much. This has been, as I said, I've learned so much and it was really interesting, um, to have you both interact, um, and from your really different vantages. So thank you so much for this great conversation. Oh, thank you so much. And I, I enjoyed talking with you, Chris, and it's, it's remarkable how, how similar our viewpoint is on how the industry has to work, even coming at it from, from a different side. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Miriam. And thank you, Peter. It's so great to meet you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Again, this has been an indie talk for Indie Memphis Film Festival. Uh, and we are, um, we are we're kindly supported by the Holmberg Foundation. Thanks again. Bye.